Hello, my name is Alec Cooley. Welcome to today's webinar on the lessons learned from parks and streetscape recycling. This is one of the periodic series of webinars produced by Bush Systems. As the title suggests, today's program will explore the challenges for recycling in outdoor public spaces like parks and streetscapes, as well as the steps different communities have taken to overcome them. To help me explore these issues, I'm joined today by four panelists with, uh, with hands-on knowledge promoting and managing recycling programs in different areas across the Canada and the United States. Krista Rust is a senior program manager of the Recycle Everywhere program, which is an extended producer responsibility initiative in the province of Manitoba that's run by the Canadian Beverage and Container Recycling Association. Then we have three, uh, four speakers representing local communities. We have Emily Willoughby, who is a policy and programs planner for the District of West Vancouver, British Columbia. And not shown here, but she will be uh, also be, uh, uh, have a colleague with her, Colette Scott Sibley, who will also be uh, presenting on their case study. Then we also have Blair Pollock, who is a planner with the Solid Waste Management Office of Orange County, North Carolina. And finally, we have Amy Lego, who is the executive director, director of Operation Downtown which is a municipal improvement district in Des Moines, Iowa. Today's program will be split will be split into two different sections. We'll start by having each of our speakers give a brief presentation going over a high level introduction to their programs. And then we'll use the second half of the program to, to, to uh, dig deeper into some of the issues that are common to public space recycling programs. To help us focus the conversation, we're going to ask you to weigh in voting on a live poll about the topics that you're most interested in, and we'll use this to prioritize how much time we, we spend on each one of these. Um, obviously, we'll do our best to get through all this, but um, with a topic like this, from my experience, it's easy to, to, to go on for, for hours, and we're going to keep this program within a 90-minute period. Uh, we'll come back to this in just a few minutes and uh, to do that, that voting poll. Uh, in the meantime, to avoid background noise, we'll keep all attendees muted. We have several ways, however, to make this as interactive as possible. You can type questions for our speakers at any point. To do this, expand the GoToWebinar dashboard on your screen, then click the tab next to questions and open up that input field. I'll do my best to read through as many of these questions as we can as we go through. I'll, I'll take one or two questions after each presentation, uh, but that we may hold some of these questions for the end if we have time to go over them at that point. Then separately, throughout the program, my colleague Nicole will be sharing hyperlinks to the various resources and documents that we, uh, that we wanna share uh, for those who are interested to dig deeper outside of the webinar. To see these links that she'll be dropping in, you'll click on the separate button for the, to open that chat box. Also from the, the GoToWebinar dashboard, you can click on the handout tab um, where you can find a, a PDF copy of today's presentation slides that you can download. We'll also be sending out an email in the next few days to share the recording of this program and as well as these links uh, to the slides. Finally, please share your knowledge and experience. Our panelists will be sharing their sense of knowledge, but we know many of you have insights that you could help uh, others to improve their recycling programs. To help crowdsource this knowledge, we've created a Google Sheet where we invite you to add your thoughts or opinions or even challenge some of the um, or some of the challenges that you're struggling with. Nicole will drop the URL to the Google Sheet into the chat box. You should see that in the next moment or so. Um, and so just copy this link and put that into a separate browser and open that up. And, um, and again, we invite you to uh, just add notes. Um, we'll see that we've seeded some questions into a few of these instances, but feel free to add your own subtopics um, and expand on it yourself. And this same sheet will remain open after the webinar, so for any notes that are left, if you want to come back afterward, that, that'll be available. One last thing before we get started, um, I want to point out that Bush Systems is partnering with Recycle Away to conduct a survey about trends and common practices for uh, public space recycling programs. This short 15 question survey takes less than 10 minutes to fill out and is intended to be a resource for program managers. Individual responses will remain anonymous, but the summary results will be shared with those who participate in the survey itself. 
we launched this just um, just a week ago, and uh, just to give you sort of a teaser of some of the early results we have, you can see here's some some responses we got to some of these questions. Um, you know, 68% of folks are saying that they have uniform style guidelines uh, for their recycling infrastructure. 70% uh, have implemented uniform color standards, blue being the most dominant. So I won't read through all these, but uh, but these are the type of questions that we're trying to capture with the survey and get a pulse of what's happening with communities. Um, around uh, Canada and the U.S. So we will send out an email later after, as the program is ending with a link to the survey and uh, it'll remain open for several weeks. And again, we encourage you to participate in, um, in that survey and then we'll, we'll share um, uh, later. Later in May, we will share the results with everybody who participates. So, I want to start off just by offering a few thoughts to frame the conversation. As many of you know from experience, recycling is not easy. Problems of contamination or people not participating can be a major challenge. Outdoor public spaces like parks and streetscapes are arguably the most challenging. The uncontrolled nature of public spaces can subject bins to extra wear and tear and other issues. Recycling programs can in fact fall apart and not succeed and simply become a second set of bins to collect trash. In my experience, there are no perfect programs in parks and streetscapes. It's, uh, everyone struggles to an extent with the same problems. What separates the successful programs from the less successful ones is the level of intentional planning and follow through that communities put into their programs. Given the challenges, you simply can't install a nice looking bin, schedule collection runs, and expect to have a positive outcome. You have to understand what kinds of waste are being generated. How is the space being used? You need well-designed bins that incorporate best practice design elements. You have to monitor the program and be ready to address issues as they come up. On today's program, we'll hear how several committees make this effort to ensure the success of their programs. And with that, we'll go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Uh, we have Krista Rust, who is a senior program director, again, with the Recycle Everywhere campaign. And Krista, if you're all set, I'll go and turn off my uh, camera and, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alec. Uh, so as Alec uh, an, alluded to, my name is Krista Roost. I'm the Senior Program Director for CBCRA Recycle Everywhere. Um, CBCRA is the Canadian Beverage Container Recycling Association. Next slide, Alec. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about us. Um, we are CBCRA, but to the public, we're known as Recycle Everywhere. Uh, we were founded in 2010, so we've been around for uh, 10 years now, working into our 11th. Um, and CBCRA implemented and operates the Recycle Everywhere program. And Recycle Everywhere strives to educate Manitobans on beverage container recycling and ensure that it's convenient to empty, uh, to take your empty beverage container and recycle it wherever you live, work, or play throughout the province. Our team operates one of the largest public sector beverage container recycling programs in Canada. Our efforts for now are focused just on the province of Manitoba in Canada, uh, but we are exploring other opportunities. We are a nonprofit industry funded organization whose membership includes beverage brand owners and distributors. Uh, CBCRA is committed to reaching a government mandated target of recovering 75% of beverage containers sold in the province. We promote beverage container recycling, uh, regardless of where those containers are, or those drinks are consumed, so uh, home and away from home. And I'll share some stats on that with you later. We have partnered with communities, municipalities, schools, businesses, institutions, parks, festivals, and events throughout Manitoba, and provide them with the best Recycle Everywhere bin for the space, free of charge. Partners simply uh, arrange for the collection of the recovered beverage containers with their recycler. Together with our partners, we are enabling new products to be made, decreasing greenhouse gases, and reducing litter in streets and parks. The core idea of our program is to combine the efficiency of a curbside system with the effectiveness of a deposit return system. Our vision is a world where every beverage container is diverted and converted, and our mission is to make recycling beverage containers easy and economical both at home and away from home. Next slide. Now, to give you a sense of how this all works, I'll just give you uh, a little bit of a, a walkthrough of, of how we 
how we do things. So in Manitoba, there was a printed uh, packaging and printed paper regulation in 2018, or sorry, 20, uh, 2008, which required that all beverage producers supplying beverages into the province either subscribe to an established program or implement their own province-wide recycling system that can achieve the mandated recovery target. Since then, we've worked closely with all the stakeholders, ensuring that the provincial government, beverage producers, retailers, and our community partners and consumers are all considered in the operation of our program. Beverage producers supplying into Manitoba are charged a container recycling fee for, for every non-alcoholic, non-dairy beverage container they supply into the province. This CRF, as it's known, ranges from one to three cents per container, depending on the type of material and the the ease of management. This funds the entire program, including infrastructure, signage, technical support, promotion, and education. In addition, this fund pays for 80% of the cost to collect and process beverage containers in the residential recycling program. In Manitoba, these producers typically pass the cost to retailers who in turn charge it to consumers. The CRF is on most store receipts and is consistent across the province. By paying the CRF with each purchase, you make it possible to transform beverage containers into something useful. The CRF ensures that each beverage sold supports the recycling process. Next slide. So for us, uh, given that 30% of all beverage containers are consumed and disposed of away from home, the beverage sector recognized that the recovery target would not be achieved through residential blue box collection systems alone. So public space recycling is increasingly on the forefront of many people's minds. We know there's a small proportion that are willing to carry a beverage container to find a recycling bin. Most of the folks though will want to dispose of it as soon as they can regardless of what type of bin it is. And our program strives to make it easy to recycle everywhere. This access also serves to reduce litter on the street, uh, which is good news for the environment but also has a positive effect on the community as a whole. People take pride in where they live, work, and play. Visitors feel welcome and admire a clean and tidy community. And by providing options for people to recycle at home or away from home, you can make citizens proud of the city they call home. We remove a big obstacle by providing beverage container recycling uh, bins at no cost. Our partners are responsible to service the bins and own the materials. Since about 2018, contamination has been a growing concern, underscoring our need for education. Simple decals are not effective if they are not paired and reinforced with messaging across a, a variety of platforms. Next slide. Like I noted in, in the previous slide, we offer Recycle Everywhere bins for public spaces and events free of charge. Our partners go online at recycleeverywhere.ca. Um, we provide support through the public uh, promotion and education as well. And we have 12 free bin models to choose from that fit any indoor or outdoor public space. We also offer dual stream bins, which provide waste and recycling in one convenient bin. Uh, our program pays for the recycling portion of that bin only, and we currently offer six dual stream bins. So we have everything from bare bins, in-ground bins, to collapsible bins that make it easier to recycle when you're going camping or to the cottage or having a picnic in the park. Next slide. We are proud to say that our program is in 100% of municipalities in this province. Each pin on this map is a city or town within the 137 municipalities that make up Manitoba. You can actually even head out into the back country to hike in a provincial park here and find one of our bins, uh, even if it's 21 kilometers in. So we're trying to really make it possible to recycle everywhere in Manitoba and give empty beverage containers a new life. Next slide. Some of our results, um, you know, building on those stats in terms of where we are present, we have our bin distribution stats. As I mentioned at the beginning, our program's been around since 2010. And as of March of this year, we have placed more than 70,000 public space bins. We have um, provided over 130,000 uh, mini bins, which are for multifamily dwellings. We have provided um, nearly 245,000 single family bins. Uh, these are bins to go in your kitchen under your sink and, and make bringing your materials to the cart that much easier. 
Uh, and we've also provided almost 100,000 bin bags, which are our collapsible bag for camping uh, or, or other ways in which it needs to be portable. Next slide. Another stat that we're equally proud of is our fast rate of recovery growth. Uh, when our program began, uh, the province was at a 42% recovery rate uh, for all beverage containers. Last year, uh, we were at 68%, um, sorry, in 2019, we were at 68%. This rate is higher than some deposit jurisdictions within Canada, but most importantly, we are also achieving high rates of recovery on PET bottles. So in 2019, 77% of all PET bottles sold in Manitoba were recovered, uh, which we're very proud of, uh, and that blends well with the national average. When uh, our 2020 numbers are, are out, and hopefully we'll have those soon, we are hopeful to see even more improvements, especially with more and more consumption at home during this pandemic. Next slide. We have a variety of tools and resources, uh, and we offer these to our partners, but many of them might be helpful for you. Uh, so I would direct you to check out our website. We have tools and resources, regardless of whether this is for at home work or play. Uh, we have lots of information on do's and don'ts. We have toolkits uh, for starting or improving workplace recycling. We have guidance uh, on conducting your own waste audit. Uh, we also have all sorts of fun stuff for kids and teachers, coloring sheets, educational workbooks, games. We pivoted a lot last year uh, and wanted to make sure that we were still getting our message out. Uh, and in terms of getting that message out, we also have Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram and have a very strong presence there. We also have all of our ads and informational videos on our Recycle Everywhere YouTube channel uh, since the very beginning of this program. So there's lots of great resources there that I would encourage you to have a look at. Next slide. This brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, I've uh, put up my contact information here uh, and I'm happy to answer questions and, and provide as much guidance as I can. Uh, so please do take down the information uh, and I welcome any other questions as well uh, on my presentation. Thank you and I can give it back to you, Alec. Okay, great, thanks Krista. Uh, we, we do have one quick question for you. Um, uh, we had, uh, Alana was asking, um, wondering why alcohol and dairy containers are not included with the program. Yes, that's a very good question. And actually, I was talking to someone this morning about that. Um, the way that the program was set up, the Manitoba government didn't want to apply any kind of uh, fee uh, to milk, uh, so uh, bovine dairy. Uh, so the Manitoba government excluded that. So if you go buy a, a carton of milk, you don't pay any container recycling fee on that. Uh, alcohol uh, here in Manitoba and likewise in, in most of Canada is also managed by the provincial government through uh, Manitoba Liquor and Lotteries. Um, they've changed their name a few times here and there. Uh, so they are responsible for that one. So our program uh, excludes those only because um, that's the way the regulation was outlined and, and those are already in the control of someone else. Got it. Okay. Um... Great. Well, let, let's go ahead and we'll move on to the next speaker and we'll, we'll hold some of these other questions for the end of the program. So thank you, Krista. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Amy Lego, the Executive Director with Operation Downtown. Good Amy. Thanks, Alec. Uh, good morning. Alec mentioned, I am the executive director of Operation Downtown. That is our downtown Des Moines business improvement district. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide, Alec. I'll share a little bit about Des Moines. Um, it's Iowa's capital city. Our MSA population is about 700,000. We boast a high quality of life, affordability, low unemployment, steady population growth, and we do have incredible public-private partnerships. Um, a little bit about downtown Des Moines. Our major industries are insurance, finance, medical, and government. We have more than 80,000 people who work downtown at corporations like Principal, Wells Fargo, Nationwide, Wellmark, Blue Cross, Blue Shield. We do have a fairly small downtown residential population, about 12,000 people, but with a lot of development in the work, we expect that number to increase drastically. Uh, we have experienced a lot of impressive growth with a lot of um, funding towards the private sector. Uh, so that will play into our public space recycling program. 
and a little bit about our, our organization operation downtown. It is our uh, business improvement district. Our mission is to enhance the quality of life in downtown Des Moines by keeping it safe, clean, welcoming, and beautiful. Our district is large. We have one large downtown district that spans over 150 square blocks and has multiple sub districts. We also uh, maintain parks with a lot of public space investment. Uh, a unique collaboration between the public and private sectors was created to provide cooperative maintenance of downtown parks and other public spaces. Um, you can go to the next slide, Alec. So we started with a pilot program. Um, with part of our work, we recycle downtown trash receptacles and remove a lot of trash from downtown. We also recycle cigarette butts. Um, as the most littered item in America, here we had a cigarette butt recycling program and we did not have a public space recycling program. So understanding one of the primary barriers to recycling in public spaces is just accessibility. We decided to move towards addressing it and started with a six month pilot program in our boutique retail district. district. We worked with the state to conduct multiple waste audits primarily testing contamination during that, that pilot period. Um, and you can see here with those waste audits, 87% of the material collected was recyclable and 98% they considered was perceived recyclable, uh, meaning they thought it was recyclable. Um, and some of those items included coffee cups and number six plastic cups, uh, which helped us with educational campaign and marketing materials. And this slide also shows um, the bins that we started with for the pilot program and learned some lessons right away from that. And that uh, example is we had the opening on top that was quickly moved to the side. Uh, we added icons to our signage. The initial signage did not have icons and then some of the education pieces I talked about. Okay, next slide, Alex. Alec. So what began as a pilot program quickly expanded to a 50 receptacle program, um, largely due to assistance from a grant from Keep America Beautiful and Coca-Cola Foundation and with the help of the city of Des Moines. We started in the two popular districts that had frequent residents, workers, and visitors. They were great spaces to serve and educate a large population. Um, in these photos here, the left two photos are Historic East Village, that's our boutique retail district. Uh, where we had the pilot. It's a vibrant and diverse district boasting many fine shopping, fine dining, commerce, and nightlife opportunities. And the other space we started in uh, early in the program was Western Gateway Park. That's on the far right photo. Um, it's a popular green space in the heart of downtown. It's a four and a half acre park. It's a major crossroads on the urban grid. It includes our sculpture park, a $40 million park with an outdoor museum, open air rooms, 28 individual art pieces created by some of the world's most celebrated artists. It also has a $32 million library with a green roof and education center. It really serves a culturally diverse local, statewide, national, and international audience as a hub of numerous year-round events and activities, and as a common space for food trucks as well. And being in the middle of many corporations, um, it's a very pedestrian-friendly location, frequented frequented by the local lunch crowd and out of town visitors as well. After those first two districts, we then expanded to other districts, including our arena district, central business core, and our nightlife district. Uh, that photo in the very middle with the uh, courthouse in it, that is our nightlife district. That photo was taken during our farmer's market, um, which we have 20,000 people every Saturday at. So, uh, we were reluctant to go into that nightlife district, but it has proven we haven't had any problems. Um, and I think it's been really helpful with the farmer's market also. Okay, next slide. So Recycle DSM is downtown Des Moines public space recycling program. The aim was to create a cleaner and greener, greener downtown DSM for all workers, residents, and visitors by primarily making recycling bins available in key public areas. Some of our goals were to educate and encourage those downtown to use recycling receptacles in the correct manner, reduce the amount of recycling materials going to the landfill from downtown, 
can further extend efforts to provide recycling options for residents, workers, and visitors. It really extends the recycling from the residential and commercial sectors to the public realm. It also supports the city goal of 100% reduction of solid waste by 2050. Some of our outcomes uh, were a 14% reduction in trash the first year, which doesn't sound uh, huge. However, um, because our downtown is growing so quickly, that that number is more important because our residential population keeps growing, our visitor population keeps growing, the development keeps growing. So even had we stayed a similar amount of uh, trash, I think we would have considered that a success. We've also done surveys um, and 77% of survey respondents have used the recycling receptacles. 93% think the signage is clear. Um, and worth noting in these slides, from the pilot program until these slides, you can see in the photos, those bins were adjusted to have the opening on the side um, to account for some of the lessons learned and the icons were added as well. Okay, next slide. So we did learn, research showed us that education and marketing were really key to a successful program. So to raise awareness, we held a press conference to introduce Recycled DSM. We also implemented a lot of other marketing strategies. Uh, I won't go into detail, but I'm just gonna fly through some of the things that we did for marketing. Um, we had signage with clear information on what can be recycled. We had A-frames with more information, for example, that coffee cup um, problem that we had. We also had 50 pieces of unique sidewalk art hand painted throughout the districts that said things like you can see here. Those also uh, really did a lot for social media. A lot of people posted them just for the quote, like it's the little things. Um, we also launched a social media campaign, including video. To further encourage patrons to recycle, the ambassadors handed out cards for anyone caught helping to keep downtown safe, clean and beautiful. This program allowed them to thank the public for doing their part by recycling, uh, but it was a free drink from a local partnering business or businesses, we had a few businesses. Uh, we also worked with chambers, neighborhood associations, park staff, public work staff, state library, higher education center, area businesses, food truck vendors, um, and, and nearby residents also. We also asked our corporates and some of our neighborhood association associations to share our recycled DSM information via newsletter and staff emails. So some of those corporates, again, I mentioned before, like nationwide, um, did send out information. So that was helpful as well. We also created a website. Um, the ambassadors had recycled DSM shirts. We did a lot of letters to businesses, uh, neighborhood newsletters. So we held an Earth Day event as well. Okay, next slide. Um, our partners and grant from Keep America Beautiful and Coca-Cola Foundation were really key to being able to pull the trigger for this program. Funding came from our improvement district, the grant and the City of Des Moines Public Works. In addition, the Chamber of the City of Des Moines Parks and the Iowa Department of Natural Resources were very closely involved as well as many companies, hospitals, neighborhood associations, other organizations who partnered to really make the program possible. Downtown Des Moines level of collaboration and community support has led to countless game-changing initiatives throughout Des Moines and Recycle DSM is no exception. I'll share a few details about our operations, uh, but I think we'll go into more of that later. But um, for example, we use multiple different types of receptacles really to match the different trash receptacle designs in the different districts, which were generally chosen by landscape architects. So we would try to match those as best we could, but always keeping the receptacles blue. Uh, we have single stream recycling. All of our receptacles <clears throat> are hands-free. We also have a bottle can deposit in Iowa, um, which does make things tricky but uh, we actually just kind of go with it. We don't have as much recycling to count for um, in numbers, but um, we found generally we leave them unlocked. We don't even secure them to the ground. That leaves us a little more nimble um, on where demand is. But um, generally we find people do collect cans and bottles from these recycling bins daily. 
um, but are pretty respectful about closing them back up. So we haven't had a big problem with that. Um, and you can see in the photo here, we did try bags, but ultimately we now use rigid liners. With that, I'll open it up for questions. You can go to the next slide, Alec. I think I've got a question slide. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, Amy. Um, we, a, a couple of folks raised, raised questions about um, how to get resources for the cigarette butt recycling in, um, in the park. Um, sure, and we have that all throughout downtown. I think we've recycled like a, almost 200,000 cigarette butts um, since we've been doing the program. We work with TerraCycle on that and we collect them all and mail them in to be recycled. Okay, great. Um, the other thing I would point out is uh, uh, Keep America Beautiful also has a, a program for cigarette litter uh, resources to help with that, including yes, thank you. Fantastic done grants uh, for, for collecting devices and others. So it's something to look into. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna have one more question for you, but before we do that, um, I'm going to open up a live poll we, just to get a, a feel for who's on the program and um, you know, get a sense for, for what issues you guys are facing. Uh, we're going to go ahead and open up a live poll. It should come, pop up on your screen and we'll take 30 seconds uh, for folks to click on this and then we'll see the results in a moment. Um, but while we're waiting for folks to fill that out, uh, another question that came in for you, Amy. Um, how would... Um, uh, let me see here. The qu question had to do with with liquids. With with uh, do you, do you experience a lot of cans and bottles getting tossed into the bins that still are full, you know, half full of water or or soda, and with that becoming a problem, uh, contaminating paper? Um, is that something you could you could speak to? Sure. Um, yes, we absolutely have that problem. I think that's part of switching away from the bags. Um, we do just use the rigid liners and we'll have drainage in them. Um, so I think that helps a lot. We do a lot of power washing and cleaning also uh, to keep the areas as clean. But yes, it is a problem, not a major enough problem that we've, that we've had to do anything substantial short of um, having holes in the bottom of our liners. Hey, sorry, it was uh, you to myself. Um, uh, if we've closed the poll, then um, we will move on to our next speaker now. So welcome, Blair. Good day, um, everybody. I know for some people it's morning and some people it's not. Go ahead, Bill. Just go ahead, Alec, or... Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, um, I have to say from my first two speakers, uh, I've already learned a lot in my head spinning from the, uh, the the amount of new things we have to do with our, our modest uh, away from home recycling program. So go ahead on. Next slide. A little bit about Orange County, North Carolina. Uh, we're in the north central part of the state and um, we are, you know, geographically, relatively speaking, pretty rural, but the uh, majority of the population's in our three towns, and that's where most of the focus of today's presentation will lie. Um, our three towns, Carborough, Chapel Hill, and Hillsboro, are all really different, and um, the county's about uh, 270 years old now, so with people, um, anyway, uh, the, uh, the Europeans have been around uh, as organizing county for a long time and the Native Americans for quite a bit longer, maybe 7,000 years. Next slide. 
So this is the overview of our omnibus, what I call away from home program. Uh, we're gonna focus today on the pedestrian bins, but just to give you a snapshot, we have recycling at the park and ride lots that are mostly focused on UNC Chapel Hill. We're kind of a company town in Chapel Hill, U University of North Carolina is the company. So to get um, cars off campus, the, U the university created some policies in conjunction with the state and the town to have park and ride lots. So a lot of people park on the perimeter. Uh, we have a unique uh, or relatively unusual anyway, convenience store program where about half the convenience stores in the county now have uh, participating in our program at no cost to them. The county recycling program sets out bins and um, those who are uh, stopping to get gas or um, snacks, whatever, can also conveniently deposit their cans and bottles. Um, we also are in charge of the parks recycling programs and throughout the county there's a, a, a collection of 24 different parks ranging from large state parks to uh, small municipal pocket parks and um, ironically Duke University based in Durham is the biggest single landowner in Orange County but um, they don't have any um, recycling facilities or any kind of trash facilities in their thousands of acres uh, nor does University of North Carolina nor uh, TLC's uh, Triangle Land Conservancy. Today we'll focus on pedestrian bins and, um, in all of our three towns. And, and unlike my two predecessors, I'm the, the little guy in the, in the mix here. We have uh, a whopping 53 bins in all of our downtowns and uh, the styles are different as uh, Amy pointed out earlier, but not for reasons of, um, that we've had any control over. We've just tried to go along with what the towns were, were doing and they got grant money as individuals. And we charge them $10 per month per bin as the county recycling program to service those. So it's a relatively unusual uh, model for uh, paying for this service. Next. So this is just a map kind of giving you an idea of uh, the scattergram of where um, the bins are located. So in the lower half, you can see Chapel Hill and Carver adjoin each other the, and the higher density of bins. And then uh, northern uh, part of the county, Hillsboro, um, has a, a cluster of the downtown bins. And then the yellow um, dots are convenience stores, which are located all over throughout the county. So the collection from all of these is integrated into other collection routes. So there's no unique collection that's specific to the particular program. Go ahead. Um, Alec asked me to focus a bit on the parks program, even though that's not the primary focus of today's program. So again, you can see the parks throughout the county that are operated by the town and the county and the state of North Carolina. Uh, we service all of those in various means and modes. Um, some of the towns that wanted to avoid, for example, our collection cost per park said, we're going to consolidate all those at our public works yard and you come and get it. So they avoid the annual fee for uh, collection from any uh, facility, whether it's government, private, public, nonprofit, we charge every every front door in the county pays $142 annual recycling cost that covers all the programs, including this one. Other towns have said, no, no, we want you, Orange County Recycling, to collect at all of our parks. And so you'll see uh, that, that our routes run the gamut of the whole county. Go ahead. So um, this gives a little bit of an idea of how different things can be in even one park. Cedar Falls Park, uh, in the, the town of Chapel Hill installed the bins that you see on screen left um, uh, early on and no, no um, input from us, but they, they seem to work okay. They're made with the recycled uh, HDPE bottles and they um, don't have very long lasting iconography on them. Uh, I learned some lessons today about that. The restrictive holes are, of course, good. And over time, the, they've experienced a little bit of fading, so they need some dressing up. And then uh, when the county converted most of their baseball fields to soccer fields and got a lot more activity, um, they said, gee, we don't have enough recycling bins. Will you, Orange County, come and put out some bins? So what we had was our curbside blue uh, recycling carts. So um, in, in one single park, not 30 yards apart, there are 
um, very different kinds of recycling containers and we collect from all of them, but this uh, kind of group incrementally and we just rolled with it. Go ahead. I guess there's a bit of a delay between um, asking for advancing and getting it. So whenever. <clears throat> I'm not sure what where we are, Alec, with the slide advancement here. We stalled. Oh, we, we can hear you now. Okay, I can hear you, but I don't see a slide advancing. And now I just see me and no slides, so <laughs> a little bit flummoxed. Uh, let me pull it back up again. Okay. Sorry for that. Uh, so it's okay. Easy. All right. So this is um, getting into some of the detail that the uh, the town of Carborough, Chapel Hill, and Hillsboro all purchased their own bins using grants from our uh, Department of Environmental Quality and shout out to the subsection of the Division of Environmental Assistance and Customer Service, DEEKS, as it's known for uh, providing grants specifically for uh, pedestrian type bins. So over the last um, eight years, it's enabled us to, or enabled the towns to go ahead and purchase bins of their choice. Uh, they got 80% of the grant money back. And so um, the downtowns are all small. We're, we're a small um, series of small towns. So you can see the number is uh, relatively uh, small compared to what you've seen in the two previous slides. Go ahead. And this hasn't changed much in five years. So this gives you an idea of the cost range for the various bins and um, uh, not to advertise for any particular company, but just to give you an idea, um, Victor Stanley is a fairly uh, well-known company that makes the, 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 the nice curved rib kind of bins with openings at the top. Uh, we requested the town of Chapel Hill, the earliest adopter to use a, a front loading bin, as Amy pointed out, it um, gives you much better results. and. Uh, so over a couple of different grants, they put in those front loading ones and then Hillsborough already had the uh, conventional Black Street trash can. So they went ahead and got um, recycling bins that uh, paired with those uh, and they were interested in the landscape design issue. Go ahead. I mean, the urban streetscape design issue. So you can see Carborough, they already had the blue motif, but they had it for everything. Their, their bus bench included as well as their trash bin. So when recycling came on the scene, they differentiated it with the white band and the, uh, the top with information on it about what could be recycled. And a little hard to read, but you know they put on there the, the wording for cans and bottles and uh, we plastered our little ubiquitous no plastic bag sticker on those. Uh, and that, that that has worked reasonably well. We don't see many plastic bags as part of the contamination issue. Go ahead. Chapel Hill um, took it, like I said, a slightly different approach. Again, these are all, the recycling bins were all retrofit. And so the uh, urban designers said, we're going to go with a color that uh, matches the existing color scheme. We don't care about Blue for recycle. Blue means recycling, even though most everywhere else blue um, recycling containers, et cetera. And that that actually is a Canadian invention from the old blue box programs of the early days of recycling. And the rest of us kind of went along with um, worldwide, with, as far as I can tell, with the blue motif, which is great. Except um, the town of Chapel Hill went its own way, as it often does. And uh, I'm I'm happy to say that thanks to my urging, they did at least put the the opening on the front and you can see that it's a Saturn type opening that accommodates paper but uh, the messaging is for cans and bottles and my colleagues have prompted me to add um, much more um, pictorial information in addition to the um, the uh, the written information go ahead so what you know what happens in the real world is strikingly different from um, 
what um, what happened when we first set it out. So unfortunately, these uh, bins in Chapel Hill are subject to a fair amount of graffiti, and uh, that's increased with um, gang activity in the last few years. We I don't know what these tags signify, but because it's a, a relatively poor surface, it'd be awfully difficult to get the graffiti off. So it's been left so far. And you can see it's a front opening bin, which makes it a lot easier on our collector. We have a, a, a mini sized uh, compaction truck that collects most of this. And the uh, the collector guys have have done that the ice cream truck. I'm not sure why, but um, the other thing I wanted to point out is things are fluid and malleable. So the blue cart that you see at the bottom slide, that arrived not courtesy of us, but one of the local businesses apparently decided that it needed to be out there next to the existing recycling bin. So we didn't the street side one that we put in, uh, and we've chosen not to remove it. It's well this must be here for a reason. So uh, instead of fighting it, we've kind of gone with the tide. And when I went out to take these pictures with our collector, well, we said, let's leave that thing there. But it is a little curious that we don't know how it got there, who put it there, but we've been flexible. Go ahead. So Hillsborough went, again, a slightly different route. They, they did uh, Get the black trash can, and they and they did put the um, the the hats with the vertical openings on them. The um, the manager of the recycling program or the streetscape program there resisted mightily. Uh, she put only the word recycling on the side of those, and I have some stickers that say cans and bottles. Um, after about a year of jawboning, she finally allowed me to put the can and bottle stickers on top. And don't you know that contamination went down and cans and bottles went up? So. Thank you, Stephanie, for being flexible in the face of change. Um, and these are uh, a nice pairing with the vertical opening and contained and so on, but they do uh, open from the top. So it's a little bit of a challenge to serve them. Go ahead. So what's in the bins, you know, unlike my colleague, Amy, and Amy, I have to tell you, I'm super jealous of your 87% recycling rate and I saw in the poll that contamination was the single biggest issue. Um, so, uh, you know, we we had, if, if anybody who's a numbers freak saw that we had 53 bins in the in the universe, but we sampled only 48 because the other five were empty um, at, that we sampled in the winter when it wasn't great weather, uh, spring here, but still wasn't great weather. So um, the sort of the conundrum if you're a recycling person is, does the weight count more when you include the paper, some of which was wet, or does the number of cans and bottles collected count more? So um, by a contamination ratio, 79% by weight was recyclable, and I didn't try to wring out the paper to make it dry. Um, the wet paper is going to go through a pulper anyway. The uh, by by volume, 52% uh, of the units, cans, bottles, cups, etc., were recyclable. And for those who care about this issue, yes, of the non-recyclable stuff, 68%, uh, almost 500 were cups. So um, we're probably going to go back and you know, to the extent that we can, write the word no cups and kind of bite our tongue because of so many of the. The plastic cups are now either number one or five, which are inherently recyclable, but it just makes it too confusing, I think, to say to people, yes to the number one or five PET polypropylene cup, no to the number six, and you really don't want your you know, gloppy frap um, material in there. So um, it, we just start continuing with the can and bottle messaging, even though we'll miss out on some recyclables by doing that. And obviously we need a lot more public education to diminish the cups. And um, go ahead to the last slide, please. So for those of you who really wanna geek out on the numbers, here's what you can compare uh, town by town. And I just wanna point out in the red there um, <clears throat> where you see that Chapel Hill has 61% uh, cans and bottles um, recycled compared with a lower percentage in Carborough or Hillsboro. We went early with the uh, very differentiated bin and we went early with the vertical opening <clears throat> and specifically referring to cans and bottles. So that that those really made the difference. And of course, it's a small sample. So um, for those of you who haven't ever pawed through um, 55 bins or 50 bins worth of cans and bottles, you haven't lived. 
So I, I urge you to go ahead and paw through your downtown recycling sometime when you're feeling um, under underworked. And that's all I have, Alec. And thanks everybody for paying attention and listening. And I'm grateful to be part of this great panel. Great, thank you, Blair. Um, we have a couple questions. Um, one uh, for for that mysterious bid that appeared. Um, did um, <laughs> do you, did they take responsibility for that, or is that something that just is left there and that that's expected that the owner or put it out there is responsible for it? Well, the county provides recycling services at all the businesses that are clustered around that particular corner. So we believe that what happened is that some owner of one of the businesses took it upon themselves to put that cart out there next to the bins. And probably, you know, there was an overflow issue from the bins or something, but it is a county owned recycling cart. We do service the other carts that are behind that cluster of businesses. So we just said, okay, it's not any more contaminated than anything else we service. There must have been some reason for it. So we just were flexible and let it ride. Got it. Okay. Uh, another question that came in is, uh, are, are any of your bins in the historic district, were there considerations as far as the type of bins that were allowed to be put out because of design? Oh, I'm glad you mentioned that. <laughs> uh, the very first bin that we built in 1992 um, was in the historic district by a matter of 50 feet uh, in front of the old post office where I showed that cluster of Chapel Hill bins. So um, it, it's unfortunately, unfortunately, from my perspective, been demolished because uh, the police department determined after some uh, protest that it was a place that people sort of hid behind. It was a brick container um, and made with uh, a, a custom-made steel top and custom-made openings and grates. And it was in the days before uh, we had um, digital photography. So I never got a picture of it before they demolished it. But um, it took about a year in front of the historic district commission from the time that I presented the, the drawing for them to allow us to build it. It was a $3,000 custom made uh, bin. And the town of Hillsborough, which also has a historic district, came and toured it, saw it, rejected it. So there was no downtown recycling bin in Hillsborough for many years because they wanted it to comply with their historic district. And so um, until they came back with their own approved design, we didn't do that. But um, we built two of those brick and steel type containers and uh, they've both since been demolished and replaced with conventional containers like you saw. Got it, great. Okay, we'll go ahead and Shift then to our final speaker, speakers. Um, so we um, introduce Emily Willoughby uh, with um, the District of West Vancouver and her colleague, Colette Scott Sibley, and I'll let you guys take it from here. Sure, thanks, Alec. Um, so I'll just point out, I'm going to take the lead on this presentation. Um, my role was more around launching a pilot program in 2017 and expanding our um, street side recycling program uh, across the municipality. But since that program has launched, Colette has taken on the management of day to day operations um, and stats tracking. So she contributed to the presentation and may chime in for questions uh, at the end here. Um, but I'll take the lead on the presentation. Thanks, Emily. So um, what I'll do first is uh, just a quick introduction of the District of West Vancouver. Um, so the District of West Vancouver in British Columbia, Canada, has a population of around 45,000 people. Um, we are just across a bridge from a much larger, denser Vancouver, BC, um, which has approximately uh, 600,000 people. Um, and we're one of three municipalities on Vancouver's North Shore across that bridge. Um, in the Metro Vancouver region, there are 21 different municipalities. Um, so we have a lot of information sharing that happens uh, amongst ourselves um, about best practices um, around waste collection uh, in, in the region and how we can maximize um, waste diversion in different sectors. Um, West Vancouver is primarily single family residential. Um, we do have five denser commercial village areas, 
uh, in the community. And so those village areas have been where our street side recycling program is concentrated. Um, and finally, we're a community nestled between the ocean and the mountains. Um, so we're on a hillside, we have beachfront, we also have backcountry mountain access, um, all part of our community. Um, it's a beautiful place, um, but it is tricky uh, to provide um, these kinds of services when you've got such a diversity of, uh, of park areas and, and village areas. Um, so with that, we can actually go to the next slide and then we'll skip right ahead um, past the outline. You can, yeah, thank you. Um, our public realm recycling programs are designed based on a very successful residential collection program that's been in place in uh, on the North Shore um, since the 90s. Um, so our uh, curbside collection program in that top photo there um, has a very high participation rate with uh, over 95% of households regularly participating in the weekly collection service. Um, our program also has exceptionally low contamination uh, in West Vancouver, so less than 5% uh, contamination in our residential program. Um, we are able to achieve greater than 70, 75% diversion in our, in our residential sector, um, and that is waste that's sorted into recycling bins or into curbside organics collection. Um, our curbside residential program is supported by extended producer responsibility and packaging and printed paper regulations which Krista mentioned in her program uh, from Manitoba. So Canada does have a pretty progressive EPR system that does uh, support uh, in BC at least the residential portion of this collection. Um, because of the success of our residential program, we really wanted to give people the opportunity to see similar recycling um, options in public spaces. So we started with an expansion into our public buildings, indoor areas of civic buildings, uh, the second picture there. And then finally, most recently, into our commercial spaces. Um, so you'll see very, very consistent colors, very consistent iconography um, of our bins, whether you're at home, at the community center, or uh, in a commercial streetscape area. Um, for our public outdoor program, we selected three streams, uh, garbage, paper, and mixed containers. Our mixed container stream accepts the same materials that are accepted in the curbside blue box. Um, our bin choice was a three stream, three stream unit, uh, all in one. Um, we focused on commercial street sides only uh, and do not currently provide recycling in parks. Um, that's because uh, with uh, commercial areas, there's a little bit more control over the types of materials that might end up in your bin. And then there's also a volume issue. Um, uh, as I mentioned, we have some beautiful waterfront parks that are regional destinations. And uh, the volume of waste that we manage in some of those parks is tremendous and would be very challenging um, to handle with a multi-stream system without um, well, pretty substantial changes to uh, to the types of bins we'd have to do um, compacting or underground bins um, to be able to accommodate the kind of volumes that we see there. Um, another thing that's pretty key about our program in West Vancouver is that, uh, like Amy's program in Des Moines, um, we really prioritize resident and business engagement to maximize the impact of rolling out this recycling in commercial areas. Uh, next slide, please. So the, here's a map of the bins that are currently in place. Um, before launching district-wide, um, we hosted a one-year, 12-month pilot in Horseshoe Bay Village, um, beginning in spring of 2017. Um, Horseshoe Bay Village is an interesting pilot site because it's a very popular tourist destination. Beautiful park, great um, set of businesses, active business association there, also home to a regional ferry terminal um, that provides crucial transportation services um, for regional travel, connecting um, the lower mainland here with uh, Vancouver Island, which is the size of New Jersey um, and has lots of people living on it. Um, so uh, with the ferry terminal, um, Horseshoe Bay Village sees thousands and thousands of daily visitors, particularly during peak summer months. Um, during our one-year pilot, um, we did a lot of research and monitoring um, to make sure that we were achieving the outcomes that we hoped for, which were diversion and low contamination. 
Um, so five waste composition studies during the course of that year to capture serial, uh, seasonal variation in volumes and waste composition. Um, we did a couple of user observation periods, some user interviews, things like that to really fine tune um, our pilot program. Uh, and inform our fall program rollout, which took place uh, by summer of 2019. Um, we expanded the program to these uh, three other um, commercial village centers, um, converting nearly 100% of the district-owned garbage bins located in commercial up, uh, areas um, to from, from garbage only to three stream recycling uh, stations. Um, and we can pop over to the next slide. So, oh, I think we skipped one, but that's okay. I can just skip one. Um, <laughs> so the program is funded. Oh, maybe they're just not in the right order. That's okay. Um, so this program is funded through the solid waste utility. Um, all of our solid waste collection programs, residential, um, civic building, uh, special event, and street side uh, collection are all funded through the solid waste utility, which is a bit unique um, in that it's entirely separate funding from general revenue at the municipality um, and billed separately on a quarterly utility bill to residents. Um, the solid waste utility assumed financial responsibility for public realm waste in 2016. Um, what's exciting about this uh, is that uh, Combining the funding source for all of this waste collection services across the municipality into one place uh, resulted in a much stronger collaboration between various municipal departments, uh, parks, buildings, um, and, and engineering who are responsible for the collection of that material um, in different ways. So we regularly now discuss uh, how to reduce waste in, in various sectors. Um, our capital cost for the entire program, pilot, and, um, and overall rollout uh, for bins was uh, under $150,000 over two years. And I'll point out that these are Canadian dollars because I know we have a mixed audience on, on the uh, webinar today. Um, and then our annual operating costs, uh, you can see there the pilot and then, and then the ongoing annual and our investment in education. Um, next slide, please. Um, the variation in cost for servicing uh, for the pilot and the ongoing service um, are, are a bit different, first because of scale, but second because of the way we did it. Um, so during the pilot, it was pretty small scale, only eight bins. Um, so we did service in-house using a converted leased pickup truck um, and processed, uh, collected the material for processing at our uh, municipal operations center. Um, when we expanded the program, we um, went uh, with a contracting out option for collection of the bins that are three stream uh, and along the primary corridor in the district. Um, so our contractor for that service is, is called Growing City. Um, they've been a great partner in providing that service because they're a waste collection company that is really, really committed to waste reduction. Um, they started their business um, with uh, the express goal of helping um, commercial properties re uh, divert organics. Um, so they've grown since then. Um, you can see there their collection truck, um, which is a, a box truck that uh, uses mega bags to sort the materials. Um, and, and then uh, they deliver uh, materials direct to the processor. Um, because Growing City uh, as a company is committed to waste diversion, um, they do a really great job training their staff um, to do assessments of contamination on site of collection. Um, so you can see staff here, uh, they scan a QR code at the bin, they take a photo, and if they observe greater than 5% contamination in a bag, then that bag um, wouldn't be accepted at the processor, so it is directed into garbage. So our um, our Contamination numbers are based on that at a collection site diversion, um, which is great. It's really great data for us to collect um, and to have and to monitor our program. Um, and, uh, and it also allows us to um, monitor how frequently the servicing needs to take place as well. So we, as I mentioned, we see great variation in seasonal um, activity at these bins. Uh, in the winter months, we will service uh, between between two and three times a week, depending on location. Uh, during the summer months, it's at least daily servicing um, for all of the locations to make sure that the bins aren't overflowing. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, so, as Alec mentioned in the introduction, and as Amy certainly mentioned in her presentation um, from Des Moines, uh, public space recycling is not easy. Um, and a primary challenge, uh, known challenge, as we enter into this uh, adventure that is providing street side recycling for, for our residents and visitors to the municipality. Um, at what we know is that if the point of the program is diversion over optics, um, you must engage bin users as active participants uh, in recycling. Otherwise, it's just really expensive garbage. Um, so we did a lot of community engagement uh, throughout, uh, leading into our pilot, um, throughout our pilot in Horseshoe Bay, and then to uh, during during our full rollout. And we continue that community engagement today. Um, so here are just some examples of materials we've produced. Um, two of the more exciting examples um, of community engagement that the district has engaged in are uh, one is our student video contest. Um, so uh, annually, the engineering department hosts a contest. Um, our theme in 2019, as we rolled out uh, the uh, district-wide program, was uh, that bins don't recycle, people do. So we asked students to create 60 to 90 second videos talking about why contamination is a problem and what they can do about it, how our community can help reduce contamination in public recycling bins. Um, we also created an online game um, through our residential recycling app. Um, uh, Recollect is our service, service provider for that and they have a game platform. Um, what's different about our game than many others is that our game focuses on public space recycling um, and encouraging people to learn how to properly sort materials when they're out and about at community centers and uh, in the commercial areas outdoors. Uh, next slide. So just a snapshot at some of the data we've been able to collect from our program. Um, during the pilot, our target was that we were able to recycle um, about half of the material that we were collecting at the curbside or at the, at the street side, um, which we achieved during the pilot. Um, and our goal um, based on best practices research was, can we achieve less than 25% contamination? And we, we thought um, that the container stream would be uh, a more challenging contamination space, um, when in reality, um, what we're finding is actually the paper stream is more challenging um, for contamination as we've gone to a full full rollout. Um, and we were able to achieve during our pilot both of those targets. Um, uh, since we launched the complete program across the municipality, we've recovered 75 tons of recyclable material. Um, our diversion rate um, is 35% here, but that includes some garbage uh, only bins as well. So that skews your chart that you're seeing here. Um, when we remove the garbage only streams, our diversion uh, rate is actually closer to 50%, um, 45% if you wanna be precise. <laughs> um, so we are close to that target. We have seen some decrease in, can, in, um, in our diversion rate over the last year or so. Um, Maybe some of that is due to COVID. We're not sure, we're monitoring it and um, we'll be um, pushing out some more public education to try to address that and get our diversion back up um, this summer. Um, so there's a snapshot of, of how the program is, is doing. I, I think um, with that, I can kind of wrap up here. I know we're gonna move into some discussion about some of these topics in more detail. Um, so Alec, maybe I'll, um, we can go to the next slide, which is just a conclusion, um, but I'll open it up to you, Alec, to, to field any questions. Great. Thank you, Emily. And uh, that was uh, great information. Um, we do have several questions, but a lot of these tend to towards some of the discussion items that we're going to cover. So. Let's go ahead and just shift over to that um, part of the presentation. Um, so if our other panelists want to turn on their cameras, um, we'll start out. Um, let's start out just talking a little bit about bin specs. Um, I'm going to skip over here a couple slides. Um, oh, just just before I go, I, I just a reminder again that we do have this this um, this Google Doc encourage folks if they want to drop in uh, some, some comments, some of their own experience, what they found works 
on that Google Sheets uh, be a good way of sharing resources with other folks. Um, but, but let's talk a little bit, let's start out just talking about bin specs. What is it that you look for on, when you're when you're selecting bins that to you is kind of essential? What, what are the really important things? And um, you know, a, a big part of that obviously is gonna be the behavior, how the bins can influence people. And we won't go in depth into that right now simply because uh, you know, there's, there are some good resources, um, uh, best practice guys that are out there and, and um, Nicole's gonna drop one of those into the, the chat function. But, but just you know, one thing that I've noticed is a commonality uh, across most of your programs is you know, doing the consistent colors, helping people to really distinguish one stream from the next so that it's obvious as you walk by at a casual glance, these are different bins. Um, you know, the consistency, even, uh, you know, I, I loved, Emily, what you talked about, the consistency with the residential program, trying to create sort of a standard expectation. All these are, are critical things, restrictive lids, all these points. So, um, and um, again, without dwelling on this, I, I, I contrast that against this photo you see on the right, which is, from my experience, all too often, this tends to be what happens in a park setting where you simply, a choice is made for nice looking bins that look the same because you want it to be aesthetic. But from my experience, you know, doing a setup like you have here on the right invites problems, the types of contamination and all that we've discussed. Um, so again, won't dwell too much on that, but I just wanted to set that up as, as one sort of baseline and, and look again for the, the best practice guide that, that'll show up in the chat box. But with that, um, um, Krista, do you want to talk a little bit about the signage and labels and what some of the considerations are that you think of? Yeah, sure. So for us, um, we we don't just look at labels with writing only. Uh, our province uh, is very multicultural, multilingual, and we recognize that sometimes people just don't read the words that are in front of them. Uh, but if there's imagery uh, and we have a, a standard set of pictograms that appear on all of our bins, so it's got the bottles, the cans, the uh, cartons and the tetra packs on it to have that clear explanation of these go in the bin. Uh, increasingly now though, there's even more need for direction at the bin. So we've been exploring and looking at opportunities to have poster signage or you know more expansive decals with the do's and don'ts or or post mounted signage um, often we find that if if someone is walking up to the bin they're seeing the bin but if there's something on top of the bin they they might not be looking at it, it could be covered in snow if you're in canada or you know it's it's not uh, grasping enough of the attention um, so for us it, it's it's a mixture of the, the image and the word um, we do have bins that are bilingual. We have a French quarter in our in our uh, community as well. So we do have English and French, uh, but more and more it, it needs to be uh, pictograms or, or um, images that are relatable and understandable to everyone. Great, okay. Um, one thing I'll point out here, I, this photo on the, the right I put in here, because this is to me an example of uh, an expectation of that you simply need to put the words on there and you're all good. But if they're so tiny that you can't see it as you're approaching, they're pretty ineffective. Um, so the juxtaposition, I think, is important to catch there between how they're displayed. Um, and this is another example, Krista, you would you would share this some if you want to say a word about. Yeah, and we we just put these ones out uh, last fall. So um, we do public opinion surveys here annually to understand um, how people uh, understand our program, uh, whether or not we're hitting the right mark in terms of education and promotion. And one of the pieces that we've heard more consistently is, you know, we got the message, we can recycle our beverage containers, but what else can I and can I not? Uh, so in, in obviously, like many people are saying, uh, items that could be recycled in your blue box at home are obviously accepted in our uh, containers, but it's it's different. When you're at home, you can rinse out the container that might be eligible, but when you're on a, a walk and you've got half the sandwich in there, that's contamination. Uh, so giving people some examples of what they would see when they're out and about in the park or, or on a streetscape so that they have that additional information and aren't just hoping like oh maybe this will get recycled and tossing it in so you know ironically animal waste appears constantly uh you know in, in at home uh, programs diapers some of this stuff you'd think is you know 
counterintuitive, uh, but we're needing to put that out there and explain to people, uh, maybe there's some misunderstandings in terms of what recycling means and if, is that composting or is it not? You know, people are confused. There's a lot of stuff going on. So making it as easy as possible uh, is the route that we're trying to do. And so far, um, you know, we're seeing some positive results and hopefully with this label and signage, we'll have more information uh, by the fall of this year of, of how well that's working for folks. Great. You actually touched on a question that the number of people put into the, the question box, which is um, yeah, how do you address specific things like cups, which oftentimes show up, but the other one is, is uh, you know, the, the, the animal waste bags, people toss their bags in there. I, I, I'm guessing a lot of others have also experienced that. Uh, aside from what you just mentioned, Krista, um, with the signage, any other words of wisdom that others can offer on how to solve that one? Well, in our case, we, we've, despite the broadening uh, acceptance of other things in recycling, in both in, in all of our public facing programs, we've stuck to cans and bottles. And that might be a little retrograde, but it's a really simple message. So, you know, my experience, once you open it up and, and actively start saying, for example, paper on the bins, it's like, oh, this cigarette box with the foil and the and the cellophane and everything, it's paper or, you know, expand that to your takeout container that may or may not have a little food waste in it, et cetera. It's paper. So, you know, rather than confuse people or try to capture everything, we just said, if we get your cans and bottles back, we're happy. Yeah. In our area, coffee cups are recyclable, um, but what we find is that we're getting coffee cups in all three streams. Um, they should be in the container stream, uh, but because a lot of coffee cups are mixed, are paper, um, they're ending up in the paper stream as well and contaminating the paper. But um, in general, um, coffee cups in the con uh, container stream, it's fine for us. Yeah, our, our processor is not worried about liquids or, or residuals as much in containers, but if you have a half full cup of coffee poured into the paper stream, that ruins a whole bag of paper. That's a problem. And so that's why our, our container contamination is actually about less than 5% um, in our street side program, which is great, but paper stream ends up closer to 10 or 15% on a regular basis. Right. And that actually touches on another question that's coming from a number of people, which is about just the paper stream itself and the challenges. Um, have you guys found you know, that it, it's worth trying to collect paper or is, is there a high enough volume of clean material that makes it worth it? Or is the, the, the potential for material to get contaminated by liquid or, or just the, the, the range of non-recyclable papers make it too much of a challenge to try and message and, and communicate clearly what's supposed to go in there. I can chime in a little bit. I'm gonna echo what Blair said. <clears throat> we have found, we do have single stream and we do accept um, all of these materials on this actually slide right here. However, we have found for messaging, it is much easier to promote cans and bottles um, because Blair, allu Blair alluded to it earlier, um, the, the whole cup conundrum, you know, that to explain to people, oh, one is fine, but number six is not. Um, and even with our coffee cups, we don't accept coffee cups because of the wax coating, but we could accept the sleeves of the coffee club cups, but trying to explain all that, you know, on a sign. So we tried, we generally have focused on, we've tried to kind of push cans and bottles and also being a, in a food truck district, um, you know, contamination is another concern with, with some of the products. So we really kind of pushed the can and bottle concept. Um, and, and I think that's helped with our low contamin rate, low contamination rate. Yeah, and for us, you know, bottles and cans, like it's the beverage containers that are our mandate. But as we've grown, uh, which is an interesting piece, there have been more and more questions about, well, why can't I recycle this item when I'm walking around in my community? So um, we, we had to kind of address it head on uh, and uh, provide more information of what is and isn't recyclable uh, because it was going to get added in anyway. Uh, so, you know, lots of the similar problems that everyone else is, is saying, but if you look on our bins, it says beverage container. 
uh, but we're now giving this additional information because people want to do the right thing. They want to recycle everything they can. Uh, it's just some stuff is really fuzzy. Yeah. Yeah. As, as a think, semantic, I'm sorry, Alec, go ahead. If you had a quick point, otherwise I was going to move on to the next slide and, and the next point. I would well, just say as, as the as the folks who've we like we have paper stream um dedicated paper stream in west vancouver and thus far it has been worth it um because it keeps the paper out of the container stream which where it would be a contaminant um, because people do want to recycle that and um a single putting the things in a single stream is much less uh lower recycling rate across the board for us some of our neighboring municipalities in Metro Vancouver, instead of providing paper, have provided an organic stream uh, in their street side recycling or in their parks recycling. So that's something we may consider moving forward, um, but thus far, we're not there yet. Yeah. Oh, I, I was just gonna add in terms of the, the whole messaging, uh, the nuances of messaging. So when, when Krista talked about the words beverage containers, it's like, okay here's my coffee cup is this not a beverage container right. and so uh, the terminology i think matters as to what you can collect and i i want to add that i'm insanely jealous of you folks who have a market for for old coffee cups that's just torture me it's uh it's part of a provincial recycling regulation um ah. so it's this is driven by higher levels of government so you I made heard. howard schultz and starbucks do it Good. Well, <laughs> I know there are initiatives that are being done to try and increase the recyclability and make it so that more MRFs can can handle it. But um, if it's a, a long term project, right? Um, I would I yes, exactly that. It's a long term objective um, that we are trying to educate people about early. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to show this slide real quick. It's just an example of something that I've not seen a lot with with bid design, but that I think really holds merit. Um, and Emily Collette, you might recognize these. These are from, from downtown Vancouver. Vancouver ones. Yeah. Pilot. Yeah. But what's unique about this, and this has to do with placement of bins and all, is anticipating which direction is traffic coming from and will people actually see the label as they approach it? Because um, it's important people ex form their expectations of how they're going to do, how they're going to sort something. They don't necessarily do it right there standing in front of the bin, they do it as they approach. So it may be too late by the time they're close enough to actually see them. And so I like how these are designed for people to see coming from an angle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just comment on that, Alec. These are these were um, a really interesting pilot um, by industrial design students in the Vancouver region um, who tested uh, the impact of, of this type of side panels um, and saw a significant decrease in contamination if you provided approach signage. Um, so mm -hmm. on our bins uh, in West Vancouver, we applied that. Um, we don't use this exact uh, bin type because custom fabrication, these, these were pilot bins, um, but uh, we did put side paneling uh, signage. So as, as people were approaching from either direction, they would see the three streams color-coded um, uh, for approach. Yeah. What's elegant about these, of course, is that the side and the top, are, but that diagonal uh, top are the same thing and it, and it sheds water and it, or snow, whatever. I'm, I'm already enamored of them. I want them. You can, you can't it's very important in Vancouver to shed the water. <laughs> and, and for those of us whose uh, rainfall just increased 20% in the last year over the average, yet yeah, down here too. Yeah. <laughs> Amy, you, you had, uh, uh, I know we spoke on the side about you really prefer the rigid liners. And if I'm correct, you, you actually don't use bag liners in your bins is that correct do you, do you want to talk about that uh, yeah um, yeah absolutely we we did try when we first implemented the program um, with with all of our trash receptacles we also do not use bags um, and so we I, honestly we tried it but quickly switched so the team um, our team of ambassadors they visit all of the bins daily um, and rather than dealing with the bags, they um, they empty the rigid liners directly into our gator and then take it back to the recycling and trash dumpsters for large removal. But um, yeah, no, our team 100% prefers, and it's, it's, it's our team prefers them, but it's also, we don't have the purchase of the bags or the appearance of the bags kind of hanging around the outside. It's cost effective. 
um, but it, it's really a lot easier um, for the team for their use of time. And, and our investor, our ops manager says, no plastic was used in the making of this program now. So um, <laughs> yeah, that's what we have found works best for our team, but I know it, it, it's all really dependent on, on your program. And, and I know that could result in a lot of savings. Uh, I know from like this indoor office desk side, when people have eliminated bags, I've heard of uh, universities saving thirty, forty thousand dollars a year on bag liners. Uh, yeah, and just to add to that, for us here in in Manitoba, you know, the provincial government is trying to move award uh, or away uh, from plastic bags. So in some areas, uh, our partners will actually do the same thing as, as Amy has, has identified and use the rigid liners and, and no bags whatsoever. It, it often gets kind of confusing too because you're told at home, don't use a bag, and then you go and you see a public space bin and it has a bag in it. So there's there's a bit of a conflicting message for folks. Uh, so as, as much as possible, some, some of our partners are trying to, to just eliminate the bag and, and the confusion at the same time. Likewise. Yeah. Blair, um, you, 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 we've spoken about the advantages of a top load versus a side load, then, as well as just where the opening is positioned. Um, can you make some points regarding that? Well, you know, just the ergonomics. Uh, you, when he lifts the bin out, when it's only um, sparsely populated, like it is now, no problem. But uh, when it's full, you know, even even if, even if it's mostly aluminum cans and plastic bottles, some glass. And in the case of these top opening jobs, some rainwater, et cetera, that's a pretty heavy lift. And, you know, ergonomically, that's the most dangerous lift you can make is straight up like that and, and almost, you know, to the point where your shoulders or uh, your arms are over your head before you clear the bin. So I'm a fan of the side load and my uh, the, the collector guy went around with uh, said, uh, yeah, double that. And, um, you know, the side loaders are uh, more um they're, they're a whole lot easier on the staff and and if you recall the slide that i showed of the little shed like ones that we're using in chapel hill downtown those are even simpler to load because they're unload because they're they're really squat and while they had a lock on them we just we disabled the lock and just used the magnet so super easy to service and then um when the when those get power washed they can actually easily take them out and hit them with the power washer and it's a it's a lot better all around Mm -hmm. how, out of curiosity, and, and this is for all of you, how often do you go about cleaning bins? Is, is there a, a regular routine or is it as needed or is that something the collection crews do as they're doing their routes or is there a, a steady rhythm you found works? Yeah, I can speak so, to our team. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay, so our contractor <clears throat> uh, cleans them as needed. Plus, they also have a twice annually, uh, tw twice a year uh, cleaning, one in the spring and one in the fall. Okay. Yeah, Amy? Ours, um, yeah, especially I think without using the bags, ours can get um, dirty. So in the summer in particular with the heat, um, they do, I should clarify, we do empty them daily. So not a lot sits in them for a very long period of time. However, in the summer in particular, um, we power wash ours at least once or twice a month um, throughout the summer months. And then occasionally throughout the winter, obviously if there's ever uh, a mess because they're monitored daily, but um, it does it does take a little bit of maintenance. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I, I wanted to talk for a minute or two just about durability. Obviously putting these out into on a street corner and parks uh, they're going to get a lot of abuse and i'm curious what observations um, anybody might have advice on on just resiliency specs features that you look for with, with bins and, and i'll jump off first pointing out a, a couple i guess for, from my perspective which is um a lot of you know just think about the environment of where you're actually located and where you're putting them out if you're near um a coast uh, marine environments Obviously, there's a lot of potential for rust just uh, if your bins are made out of a traditional steel. That's a situation where you might look for either bins made out of plastic or a stainless steel, which can be more expensive. But even aside from that, um, the hardware can be important. Um, and you know, different manufacturers, you, could, you have the option of sort of standard uh, hinges, or you can get stainless steel, again, to be able to hold up better environments like that. 
Uh, another uh, example would be in snowy areas where um, the de-icing, either the soft going on the road or even de-icing on, on pathways can be a rust threat. Um, and then just a, a, another example, somebody, I, I was speaking with somebody who, who made a very good point that they do not put powder coated bins in parking lots by supermarkets because of carts will run along and bang into them. And once you start to chip the powder coating, that can start to reveal rust problems also. So uh, a, a lot of these kind of nuts and bolts things are important to think through about how people will interact and use the bins. And it's not just the user, but how they actually will, will function in that space. I'll say one of the things that we haven't really talked about um, yet related to bin features for us is weight. We have a lot of wind and we have learned some of the receptacles we've used are too light and they take a beating. Um, so we've kind of switched to heavier. Uh, we do use a steel power co um, powder coated bin side opening um, cover on top. Uh, but we have also the one of our recent uh, lessons learned is weight because they get um, if they're not heavy enough, they can they can get kind of beat up. Yeah, and, and, uh, with uh, sorry, Alec, uh, with our program, we've been around over 10 years now. So a lot of the bins that were first put out had taken a beating and we've learned what works better. Uh, and we do take bins back and refurbish them. Uh, so uh, sandblast them, repowder coat them, redeckle them and get them back out there. Uh, the decals actually are a tricky one. And we've been dealing with that in this last year, getting them off. You know, some people have a knack for it because clearly every once in a while you come across a bin, there's no deckling whatsoever. Uh, but getting our team to pull off an old decal to replace a new one has been a bit of a challenge. So we're we're trying to work through that because in some instances, taking back a bear bin with a 200 pound uh, cement block on it is not gonna be very cost effective to take that to, to refurbish. So we're working through that with the, the advancing age of our program, but wanting to ensure that the bins look good, otherwise people aren't going to use them. Is decal, what might you say D-E-C-A-L, which I'd say decal, AKA sticker? Yes. Okay. And some of them with the sunshine and all the, you know, the weather, they're stuck on there good, but they might not be very visible. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Getting those getting those worn out decals off is unfair. <laughs> yep. Yeah. We we have just a, a couple more minutes and, and then uh, before we need to wrap up. But uh, before we do, I wanted to touch about placement and, and where do you actually put bins and are there any considerations around that? and, and um, so I, I don't know if any of you wants to, to say uh, a few items, you know, considerations around how you place bins. I can chime in on that, Alec. Um, so when we launched our, uh, as you could see from our presentation, um, we chose a single unit that has three streams, which means always there is recycling co-located with garbage um, in these commercial areas now. Um, so I think that's really key um, for placement. If it hasn't been stated yet, um, I will state it right now. Um, second, I'll say that we, as we rolled out our program, we did pretty much a one-for-one one replacement. Each garbage can was replaced with a three-stream unit uh, in our commercial areas. Um, Typically, we try to place bins so they're visible distance from each other. So wherever you're standing on that commercial area, um, you can see a bin in either direction. Um, so you know that there's an opportunity to dispose of your material coming up ahead. Um, usually that means uh, in many of our commercial areas at transit stops, um, which are spaced about every block, um, alternating sides of the street. Um, one thing we did notice is uh, some commercial businesses have a negative impact on the um, type of material and the volume of material that we uh, receive in those uh, bins, recycling stream. Uh, our particular challenge is around coffee cups. Uh, if we place a bin too close to a coffee shop, the servicing requirement is tremendous um, because to-go cups leave the shop, um, and the shops don't necessarily provide waste collection for their customers in outdoor seating areas. So those are the bins that um, are often, most often overflowing uh, and a challenge for us operationally. 
Um, yeah, just like to jump in on there, Emily, you know, that's the same thing for us too. If we see a bin uh, that's overflowing, often it's it's right next to a local Tim Hortons or a Starbucks or what have you. And the, in at least in Manitoba, those those cups aren't accepted. Uh, or if it's an ice cream store, you know, whatever the ice cream's coming out in as well. So it's an interesting piece because those locations need to manage their waste better. Uh, and everyone in, in those in instances is is hoping to wish cycle and, and make it their way into the recycling bin, ultimately making all material go to landfill. I would say our real hope of, of the expansion of extended producer responsibility programs into the public realm, um, programs like yours, Krista, is that we will see more of that in commercial spaces, uh, more of those businesses taking responsibility for on-site management of takeout uh, containers. Yeah, Alec, in response to your question about placement, ours was mostly retrofitted um, and we couldn't afford to, or the various towns determined they couldn't afford to pair every single trash can with a recycling bin. So it was kind of pragmatic. It's like, okay, where where is it the densest? Where is there the most pedestrian traffic, et cetera? And okay, here's three trash bins and we can only put recycling at one. So we we worked as hard as we could, but in terms of developing rules of thumb about, about distance and, and uh, frequency and so on, I think you know what Emily said is probably pertinent is can you see recycling from here? And Really surprisingly for us, we had probably twice as many trash cans on the street as we did recycling. So every other or every third trash can got a recycling bin. So one um, one audit that I did surprisingly showed as few cans or bottles in the unpaired orphan trash cans as they did in the recycling bins uh, where it was paired. So it's possible that our community was an anomaly in terms of, oh, people could see the recycling bin 50 yards away and so they held on to their coke can until they could get there which surprised the heck out of me that that's a rare occasion yep um i wanted to add this one other point at sort of a different angle on placement uh, which is also being very cautious about the exact location and the exact placement you know putting the bin if you haven't heard that term making sure the bins just aren't even in the same area but immediately next to each other for me is is a critical and, and I you know this photo here on the left is, is a good example where you know it seems like they're right next to each other it's only this planner between them but but if somebody's approaching from the left side and they walk by they won't even see that trash bin until most likely they've already tossed the item they had so it's it's understanding the flow of traffic which direction people are coming from um you know that i think that's all hugely important this photo on the right is from the North Carolina State Fair, and this is a prime example where you had a trash and recycling, they're right next to each other, right? Well, no, even that three, four feet is enough to create a disaster. Um, so that's uh, mapping and really understanding the space is, is, a, is a critical factor. Yeah. So I apologize, we have, um, we have lots of questions that come in and unfortunately we don't have time to get to them all, but I will, um, we, we will follow up after the program in the next day or two. Uh, we'll, we'll try to answer as many of these as we can that didn't get covered today. Um, but, uh, and, and, and we'll try and cover these again on, on a future occasion. I'm gonna just click forward to, um, toward the end of the program and just point out a couple things. Um, first of all, I wanna thank Thank our panelists, um, each of you, for taking the time to prepare your um, your presentations and participate in the uh, panel. So again, thank you all of you. Um, um, and I want to point out that um, that uh, for those of you who are interested, I do have a blog series I do that touches on a lot of these topics. Um, we'll we'll send out a link later on, um, and and we'll have some on um, the topic of parks and outdoor recycling uh, covering some of these best practices as well so keep that in mind and we'll uh, we'll take the the recording of this as well as some other resources that we're citing in the chat function all those we'll also include in um, in an email that will be sent out in the coming days uh, again a quick reminder about the survey that we're conducting uh, I'd strongly encourage folks if you don't mind just taking 10 minutes to fill this out um, the email likely has come into your, e uh, your email box in the last uh, uh, 20 or 30 minutes um, uh, would love to get the results in again we will share the results 
with everybody once that uh, closes. Um, and so with that, we're, our, our program is done. Again, thank you, our speakers. Um, I'm gonna do a quick handover for those of you who are interested to stay on. Um, I have colleagues, Ryan and Brian, who will be available just to answer questions you might have about some of the, the BIM products that Push Systems offers. Um, so for those of you who would like to stay around for that, that would be great. But to the rest of our speakers, again, thank you for participating and um, we'll hope to connect again on a future occasion. Great. You're welcome, Alec. It was great to be with you and everybody else. Have a good rest of your week. Bye. Great. Thank you. Thanks. And now, yeah. Brian, before I hand it over to you, um, let me I did, did have one last poll question for those who are still on. This is just a, a marketing. For those who are interested to receive um, uh, follow-up emails about our BIM products, um, there's going to be a new poll that's going to show up on your screen. And we'll just take 20 seconds for folks to fill that out. Um, and again, we, we don't uh, share email lists, but um, and, and won't send if you're not interested. But for those who are, go ahead and just check that box. Um, and Nicole, I'll just, uh, we don't need to read them out, but I guess if you just want to read, it's, it's, uh, it looks like it's slowing down the pace of folks clicking on that. We can. Um, yeah, responses are still coming in. Okay, we're finished. I'll close that poll. Okay. And there Great. we go. So with that, I'll hand it over to my colleagues, Brian and Ryan, um, and let you take it from here. Thanks, Alex. Uh, first off, I want to say thank you to all the panelists. Hopefully there's a lot of information that you guys can use uh, towards your own programs. Um, my name is Ryan. This is my colleague, Brian. Sorry if it's a little confusing. Uh, we're trying to stay six feet apart from each other over here. Um, we just want to give you guys a brief kind of rundown of who we are in case you don't know, uh, show you a couple bins that we offer kind of somewhat in person um, and answer any questions you have. Uh, so I'll just give you a brief rundown about Bush. Um, we've been around for over 30 years. Uh, our owner, Craig Bush, was one of the pioneers of the uh, Blue Box Recycling uh, bin, and then it's kind of evolved over time. Um, so where we kind of differentiate from other companies in the industry is our R&D team has been designing bins for 25, 30 years. Um, so we've come across a lot of things over the time. Um, so we're not only designing for aesthetics, we're also designing for functionality. Um, another great thing is we can customize signs and labels like you see on a lot of the bins in front of me here. Um, a lot of them we can do for no extra charge to match your program, or we can customize and add extra labels. Um, really, whatever you want that works with your program, uh, we're willing to do and look into it for you. So um, lots of companies will only kind of offer a stainless steel bin or a plastic bin. Uh, we kind of pride ourselves on being able to work with a bunch of different uh, materials, offer something that can kind of work for everybody. Um, Brian, you got anything you want to add in first before I? No, I think the key thing is customization of the products um, and the, the variety of products that is available. This is just a small selection of our outdoor opportunity bins, but uh, we've got a full selection of, of various different models and price ranges. So we're going to start. I'm just going to show you a few bins. If you guys do have any questions, uh, you can throw them into the chat. Um, we can't see you at the time, so you can just let them know, let us know through the chat, and Nicole can kind of relay the question to us. Uh, we're happy to answer whatever you need. Um, so I'm going to start over here. Uh, we have a whole series, sorry, I'll help to the other side. We have a whole series called an Inspire series of bins. Um, they're made out of 100% recycled uh, plastic, mostly made of uh, recycled milk jugs. Um, we pride ourselves on labeling. You can, it's great to have a nice fancy bin that looks great, but if people are putting the wrong things in it, it kind of defeats the purpose at the end of the day. Um, so we have multiple places for labels, signage. Um, these can easily be switched out. It comes with a liner inside that can easily be taken out. Um, I'll move over and show you this one. This is one of our newer bins. Uh, it's called the Expression. What's great about this one is it actually has four different sides where you can put uh, your signage, or a lot of places will do front and back with signage. And then they can also sell advertising space on the side. Um, can also be equipped with a sanitizer attached to it just to give people that extra point for sanitizer. 
Um, if they are touching something as they're putting something into the bin, it's great to add on. Um, so this one actually opens up, has the liners inside that you can see, easy to pull out. Um, and this one's made out of ro roto mold plastic, so it doesn't uh, doesn't rust like you get with a steel container. Super durable, people bang into it. Um, we really like this one. It's only been out for a few months, but uh, we're getting pretty good traction with it right now. And I'll pass it over to Brian. So I'll start off discussing the Euro bin here. Again, it's a, it's a nice thing with it. It side opens, the, the liner easily comes out, lockable device, and incorporated uh, canopy into the unit. Uh, again, customization of graphics. It's, it's, if required, we can essentially put um, graphics anywhere on the unit. And then our Pacific unit, this is a combination of powder coated steel along the sides with the liner incorporated right into the unit. So it lifts up, bag retention ring, and the liner can be removed. Dual sided unit. So you can have two streams in one on this unit. I apologize for the noise as I move it. <laughs> Um, do you guys have any questions or things that you were kind of wondering uh, about functionality or really anything that uh, you'd want answered? Um, I myself, I've been at Bush for about four years, so I've come across a lot of questions in my day to day. So I'm happy to answer if there's anything kind of points that uh, are interesting for you guys or something that doesn't work that you're currently trying to fix or pain points or anything really. So, Ryan, the one of the questions that's come in, uh, do you have corrugated plastic designs for recycle or compost? Do you mean uh, like for the signage or is it the actual bin you're looking to be corrugated? Paul, if you don't mind just throwing another follow up question into the question box, that would be great. And then we can get some clarification for you on that one. So if it's, um, if it's signage, of course, uh, we can print on any material you like. Um, we do all the designs and printing in the house so we can customize everything for you. Um, a lot of the times we don't even charge for a design. It's all included in the price of the bins. So um, if that's the case, we can definitely help you out. Um, we do have a couple uh, corrugated cardboard kind of bins temporary. They're more used for indoors, obviously, because you wouldn't really want them outside in the elements. But uh, we do have that option available as well. Thanks so much, Ryan. No Another problem. question that's come in, are there any rodent proof bins that could be used for compost? Rodent, uh, that becomes a challenge, but definitely we have some lids uh, which incorporate a lift lid into uh, the bin itself. Um, so there are various options. Uh, as an example, our Aspire unit has a restricted lid um, opening. Um, yeah. Here. Um, so it definitely that is an opportunity. Um, it is a challenge when you're dealing with rodents, but we have stuff that can be offered. Definitely. And you do have to watch out a little bit on the flip side too, because um, especially with the way things are right now, people are a little reluctant to be touching handles, uh, especially on garbages that are deemed kind of messy um, with lots of touches on them. So you kind of have to decide between people actually physically touching the opening on the bin uh, to keep the rodents out or um, people may not want to touch that opening and then we'll just throw their garbage somewhere else or throw it in a recycling bin next to it if you don't have the opening on that. So it's uh, just to kind of depends what's easier and what makes life easier for you guys at the end of the day. That makes sense. Thanks so much. Um, next question is, oh, how about which models are most wind resistant? Wind resistant. A lot of our models are incorporated uh, or, or manufactured that we can weigh the unit down. So there'll be actual a block area where you can weigh it down or it can actually be hard mounted to the ground. And we sell the hard ground uh, mount kits. Um, so it's kind of what best works for your needs. Uh, but definitely all of our outdoor bins can be secured to the ground or weighted down for that uh, added reliability. But if you're looking for something that doesn't really have to be weighted down or anything added to it as well, um, any of the recycled lumber bins uh, that are back here, this guy, the one up here, um, and the one behind Brian over here in the corner, they're all super heavy. Um, I know from experience trying to move them around uh, trade show floors, 
when uh, life was a little different, but uh, mm -hmm. these ones aren't going anywhere once they're up, as long as they're on somewhat a level ground. Um, but yeah, we can mount anything and add extra weight for winds as, as well. Okay, wonderful. Thanks, guys. Uh, another question here. Do we have any biodegradable bags that would go in the liners? Yeah, uh, it depends what you're using them for. Uh, depends. Some municipalities, you can't actually use a biodegradable bag for garbage or recycling. Um, so it really depends on what you're doing as a city. Uh, we don't actually sell bags personally. Um, but we do have a lot of great relationships with people that uh, sell our bins that also sell bags as well. Um, so compost bags for sure. Uh, we've got some great relationships uh, out in Western Canada with a company called the EcoSafe. Um, and we also have a lot of other great relationships, but uh, I would check with the people actually picking up your garbage and recycling before you kind of go down that road because you never know um, if they're going to be accepting that type of thing. And right, that makes sense. Yep. Okay, thanks guys. Um, just some questions here about the liners that are in these bins. Can you, do you mind just showing us again um, just the inside of and what these liners look like? So again, some of the units, um, you know, it's it, they're all easily accessible um, and they're like as a prime example there, there's four different handles for you to, to you know, utilize so they're all all a little different but uh generally our liners when they're black they're made of 100 percent recycled material um these ones are a little different as the liner is actually physically part of the container um it just cuts down on the cost and it's a roto mold liner so it's uh super easy to take in and out um it really depends on what you're doing but uh Generally, they're all a plastic liner unless you're looking for something that's uh, fireproof. Um, we do have a few options that we can work on. Nothing really off the shelf that doesn't come with a plastic liner, but we definitely have uh, options for if you do need a fireproof bin as well. I hope I answered that question. <laughs> yeah, I think that that sounds good. There aren't any more questions coming in, um, so we may just wrap up here. Are you, is there anything else that you guys wanted to share just for the folks that are still on? Um, everything we have is manufactured in North America, um, which with today's times should be an important thing. Um, even if you don't see something that we have that you want, uh, we have a great R&D team. Um, so if you have the quantities, you're looking to kind of um, do everything across the city the same, we could even look into uh, building a custom unit for you guys, trying it out, um, seeing if it works and take it from there. So just because we don't have something that works, doesn't mean we can't create something that works for you. And again, we have full customization of labels, of graphics, um, you know, signage to your heart's desire. Uh, we have print abilities in-house, so we can design it from level up uh, or from the ground up to uh, your finished product. So, and again, we just wanna thank everyone for their time today on the uh, on the webinar wonderful thank you so much ryan and brian for the folks that are left on the call just to let you know we will be sending up um, a follow-up email that will include the recording of the webinar the answers to all of the questions that we didn't get to today and some extra resources like our best practices and also a product catalog uh, so in the meantime, feel free to reach out, uh, but that's all we have for today. So thank you so much for your time and we'll be checking in soon via email. Have a thank great you. day, everyone. Thank you.